just want to greet everyone um, watching online this morning. Let's let's greet everyone online this morning. Make them feel at home. I'm so grateful for uh, what we're able to do with media right now, especially considering everything going around with uh, COVID-19 and people that don't feel comfortable with being in, in gatherings. And so we have so many uh, SRCers that are watching um, online and it's just a such a such a gift from God uh, to be able to connect it, it really is a small world after all isn't it, it, it if you got your Bible uh, turn with me to Acts um, chapter 4 and we're gonna be talking about burning ones this morning and we're gonna be looking at um, uh, 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 this place of reviving the passion and power of the first uh, century Christian how many of you Sometimes you read your Bible in the, in the book of Acts and you see, you see purpose and you see uh, passion and you see power and you say, uh, uh, man, my, my, my Christianity doesn't look anything like that, but I'm not content with that. I want, I want my life to look like that. Wave, wave at me this morning. And if you're, if you're online, put something in the comments. You read the book of Acts, you see the purpose, you see the passion. You, say the, you see the power, you say, I want to live that kind of life. I want to, I want to reveal Jesus in that, in that kind of way. And so what we're going to be looking at uh, this morning is the first century church and, uh, and the dynamic that they were living in. And we're going to compare it to the dynamic that we're living in. And we're going to see that God is, is, is that, that, that there's something that has begun in 2020 and that this is an incredible year to not escape. This is an incredible year to not attack. This is a year to be encouraged by the calamity because the chaos is an opportunity for us to reveal Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we give you this time. We give you this moment. Father, I ask that our hearts would be open. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we'd be ready to, um, to receive the word, to, to eat the word. Lord, we ask, Lord, that there would be a spirit of revelation, God, that, that, that at a certain point in time, would bypass our minds and ignite our hearts. And God, we, we, we ask, Lord, that you would come and glorify yourself, not just in this service, but especially when we leave. Lord, we, we join in prayer right now, even for um, tonight at, uh, uh, at Cal Anderson Park and, and Sean Floyd in the, and, and, and the church of Seattle that will be meeting to worship. God, we ask, Lord, that your fire would fall in that park. And Lord, we give you thanks for Sean. We thank you for the fire of God on, on his life, God. We, we, Lord, we give you thanks for Charlie Champ and what you're doing there in Florida as they go into their second week of, of extended meetings. And God, we ask, Lord, let your fire fall, God. Let your fire fall, God. Continue to show your power, Lord. Continue to show up and show off. And Lord, we give you thanks for our week of awakening that's coming up. And Steve Swanson and Troy Brewer, God, and Tony Kemp, Lord. And we give you thanks for Jeremy Nelson, God and, and um, for uh, for uh, uh, for Libby Lord and and Richard Gordon God we give you thanks for Charlie who um, who hopefully will will be able to make it God we ask that this truly would be a week of awakening for our region we thank you God that you are dispensing and dispersing awakening angels in this time Lord we Lord we declare this is the time for the Church of Jesus Christ to arise and shine we thank you Father that the earth will be be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Let your kingdom come. Let your will, let your agenda, let your blueprint be done on earth in Seattle as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen and amen and amen. Thank you so much, Chris. Let's give a big thank you to Chris and the worship team this morning. They did, they did an awesome job. The tension right now is the tension that exists. Yeah, we'd all agree there's like a certain amount of tension right now, yeah? And the problem is, is that we have perhaps this idea that if storms exist, that that must be the absence of peace. The problem is, is that we see the disciples in a boat in the midst of the storm, and the Prince of Peace was in the midst of a storm. 
How do you know that, that you worship that which you look up to? Which means that if you're still under the storm, then you are subconsciously worshiping the very thing that is over you. Which is why we talked about last week. You can be an undie. Or you can come up, and, or, you can be, or you can be over it. You can be under it, or you can be, oh, just declare, I'm no undie. I've got some, but I ain't one. Amen? 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 The, the Lord wants to bring us over it. Because you don't worship something that you're over. You cannot be over Christ. You cannot be over uh, this, incredible, this incredible kingdom. This kingdom's got a king already. That it's time for us to rule and reign with. How many of you know that, that sometimes it's nice to go and prayer walk an area, but sometimes we get overwhelmed when we prayer walk in an area? Why? Because we're in that area's atmosphere. And sometimes we can do better if instead of going into that realm, we actually ascend in our prayer closet and we go and visit that realm in our prayer closet. Why? Because we're not under it. We are now over it. Did you know that you can prayer walk in the spirit? Yeah, how do you, where do you begin? You don't, you, don't, you don't begin there. You belong in him. It's hard, it's hard to get overwhelmed when you're, when you're in him. Um, what I'm getting at uh, this morning is that there are unprecedented storms um, within our country. And what's exciting about that to me is church history. Uh, that when you read church history, it begins to tell us what takes place within the church of Jesus Christ in the midst of hardship and calamity. And we're actually going to look at, we're actually going to do a little study um, about what it looks like. Um, and and I, what, that's what I want you to do. I want you to, to, to contrast uh, the modern day um, um, uh, uh, expression of Christ Jesus versus the first century uh, passion and purpose and expression of, of, of Christ Jesus. Because, you know, in, in, times, like, in times like these, you know, uh, and, 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 and I don't know how I'm going to do this, so I'm just going to approach some different things and hopefully I don't step on, on anybody's toes. But it, 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 for the modern day uh, Christian, um, what we call persecution is when um, CNN writes a letter that says that everybody is getting COVID because they're going to um, church services. Like when there's some sort of negative press or, or when somebody gets onto your Facebook and is like, you're a moron and you need to shut up. We call that persecution. Like the problem with that is that you still have the power to unfriend that person. And yet you don't because you don't like them, but you're curious to see what they're up to every day. That's not persecution. That's stupidity. And you should just unlog off of Facebook a little. You know, if you can just, I, oh, wow, I just un unsubscribed from Facebook and now I don't get persecuted anymore. Yeah, welcome to the real world. <laughs> and I said I wasn't going to step on any toes, and then I did so on purpose, and I apologize. All right, here we go. Uh, it's funny. The modern-day church, like, the issues that we have, the things that make us, like, upset, and then you compare that, you know, to the, to the first century, to the first century church, where they had different kinds of problems. Like, being put in, like, they didn't have cinemas, okay, during the first century, so instead, you go to a coliseum, and instead of watching Arnold Schwarzenegger, right, like, tear people apart with his bare hands, you would actually go and watch Christians get literally torn apart by lions, and that was entertainment, that was like the five, that was the 430 matinee, is that you would go and watch um, real life execution of, of, of believers. And in, in this place of radical tension, we see the birth of the church of Jesus Christ. That the founder of our faith, who's that? Jesus. Okay. Um, his ministry was so popular, it only lasted three years and then they killed him. And who did it? The religious. That the first persecution that came against the anointing wasn't from the government. It was from the church. Yeah, it's true. That when God begins to move on the earth, the first wave of persecution always comes from those who think they know what's up. That, yeah, at the end of the day, it was really it, that Jesus died on the cross. Right? Like that, that, that unjust thing that took place with Jesus, it took place because of people that thought they knew God, and so they killed God. 
But then this thing shifted in the church. It went from being a wave of religious persecution to a wave of governmental persecution. We're talking about persecution and turmoil and hardship. And guess what was taking place right in the midst of the storm? That right in the midst of the storm, you find the God of peace walking on water. Whenever you find a storm, you will find Jesus in the midst of it, walking in it. You can have peace and be in the midst of a storm that you don't need for the absence of storms to define shalom. No, shalom is not a circumstance. Shalom is a person. Shalom is Jesus. You say, Pastor Darren, I need for you to to pray for this situation. No, baby, that's just a storm. I don't need you to have your storm solved. I need you to find Jesus who's walking on the water in the midst of the storm because the absence of storms does not mean that God is present. No, the presence of storms means that God is present. He's the God who finds himself always in the midst of the storm. Show me a storm, I'll show you Jesus in the middle of it. Show me a a storm and I'll show you a church that is thriving in the midst of it. The worst thing that can happen to the Christian church is the absence of storms. And we don't pray, God, send your storm. Like, God, send calamity. We don't pray for that. But we we pray, God, send revival. And guess what? A storm shows up and we say, well, it can't be now. No, the storm shows up. That means it must be stinking now. This is when I know that when the storm shows up, give thanks. Go into it. You'll find him there and when you show up he'll be there well will you say he'll say come to me get out of your comfort zone get out of your boat walk to me come to me that's what Jesus is saying right now he's saying come to me where, where are you I'm in the middle of it I'm in the middle of it we've been we've, pre- we've presented or we've received either way We've served or received, been served or been the one, the recipients of the very notion, come to Jesus and your life will be amazing. Come to Jesus and you will live your best life now. You read your Bible, come to Jesus, you will be arrested, tortured, and murdered. Come to Jesus and your comfortable life will get super, super lame. Why? Like, if you come to Jesus, you're going to need the Prince of Peace because you're going to step into your lamest life now. You better have something awesome inside of you because externally it's going to be a little tricky. Church, things have gotten a little tricky in 2020. And if you think they're going to get better tomorrow, you are, you are, you are, you are, is, you are kidding yourself. You, you need to sober up a little bit. Like, things are tricky. They're going to get trickier. Why? Two kingdoms, two agendas. It's at play, baby. And it's, it's, it's unfolding right now. You better pick a kingdom. If you haven't made a choice for Jesus, there's a subconscious choice that's already been made. It's time to jump ship off of the enemy's camp and into the kingdom of light and love. And if you still got flesh hooks in you, if you still got compromise in you, you better pick it. I have it t- that I, I, I tend, I tend, that I could care less where you attend on Sunday morning. I'm wondering where you're occupied on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night. Like, I, I, I don't know where you're at on Sunday morning, but, but what concerns me is, is where, in, in who do you live? In who do you have your being? Because it's either in Christ or it's in something that's sidious and dark and, 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 and deceptive and, 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 there, and there can't be, there can't be no, uh, I'm in Jesus' camp on Sunday. Say, no, what do you, that, that, that's, called, that's called being a spy, okay? That, that's, not a, that's not a good thing. Choose you this day who you will serve but as for me and my house we will serve Jesus Christ he is our Lord listen now listen now if you're healthy you got a good immune system you're taking your vitamin C and, and you're, you're taking your vitamin D and you're taking, you're taking your zinc and you're not overdoing it on sugar. And you're like, what are you talking about? You're talking about health. And yeah, because no one else is. Like, okay, so like, like let's say you're taking care of yourself and, and, you're, being, and you're being healthy, okay? You're not, you're not hitting the number four with no pickle and onion every, every day for lunch because you can't make a sandwich. Like, 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 like here, it used to be the double quarter pounder. I don't know what, what meal it is now. But, but like, like you're taking care, then, then what should you do? You should 
should be connecting and you should be, and, and your bottom should be here at, at church even though you have to wear a mask to get in. I, I'm sorry if that's uncomfortable, but, but things are a little uncomfortable. Do not neglect the gathering of the church, the gathering of the assembly. Why? We've assembled here this morning. Listen, if you can't be here, don't be here. Be wise. My wife says make wise choices. You need to make wise. Being here is, is, a, is a risk, okay? Uh, but don't let some sort of political mumbo jumbo keep you from connecting with other brothers and sisters in the faith. I said it. I ain't sorry. Come on. Going to let some sort of right-wing Republican thing keep me from coming to church. Not, not doing it. You see, the problem is, is um, there are a lot of opportunities right now. A lot of opportunities to go in a lot of different directions. So in order to keep me focused, I came up with a little Bible study this morning. I thought we'd do a little study so in order to just to, for Darren to stay, stay cool so, that I, so I don't step on any more toes. Okay, those are the last toes I'll be stepping on for the rest of the service. My, Andrea, my poor wife, is like, okay, let's, let's do something here. Let's do something biblical. So let, uh, Ben, if we come down just a little bit. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to do what happened to the twelve. What, what, what happened to the 12? And we're actually going to do a little study of what actually happened to the 12 apostles, to the 12 disciples. Is that good? We're actually going to see what did it cost them to follow Christ. Is that good? Why would we do that? Because we're talking about burning ones. And we're talking about that history prepares us for the future. That sometimes if you want to go forward, you've got to go back. So... This is going to be like a little Sunday school. What happened to the 12? You ready? Say amen. I'm ready. I'm ready. Good. You look ready. Okay. We see that Jesus has come. Jesus died. He resurrected. And he told, he told the believers to go into all the world and to do what? Very good. Make disciples. He said this is what Christianity looks like. Christianity looks like missions. You want to know the, the saddest part of the service all morning? When Eric and Jenny McCoy said there's only 600,000 missionaries. Why? Because at a certain point in time, we received bad theology in the church. It said there are Christians and then there are Christian missionaries. No, this is what Jesus said. You're going to follow me? You're a missionary. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What's a fisher of men? It's a missionary. There are effective missionaries and there are unaffected missionaries. If you call yourself a Christian, you are a missionary. How effective are you being? This is the model of the church. The model of the church is go everywhere and good news everything. Good news it, good news it, good news it, good news it until it begins to transform and reform and transfigure into the character and nature of Christ Jesus until earth begins to look like heaven. How does heaven come to earth? How does the kingdom come? We, the people of God, we, the sons of God, we go in and we good news it, we good news it, we good news it, and in doing so, we're partnering with the Holy Spirit to terraform something. Now, this is what's happening. When you look at the early church, what happened to the 12 is they began doing what Jesus said. Isn't it good when, when, we, when we pray and obey? So Jesus said, this is what you do. You go. So they went. So look at what happened. Like what, let's begin with um, let's begin with Paul and Peter. What happened to the 12? What happened to the apostles? Paul and Peter were legally, okay, legally put to death by the government. Rome AD 66, during the persecution under the emperor Nero, Paul, okay, Paul who wrote the majority of the New Testament, he was beheaded, okay, decapitated, okay. Peter, at this time, was crucified upside down on a, on a cross, okay? Peter was crucified upside down by his request. He did not want to die the same way that Jesus died. Andrew. Andrew went to what is now known as the Soviet Union. Why did Andrew go to the Soviet Union? He went there to make disciples. 
At the time, the Soviet Union was known as the land of the meat eaters. Christians there claim him as the first to bring the gospel to their land. He also preached in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, and then in Greece, where he was crucified. What happened to Thomas? Remember Doubting Thomas? Not the choo-choo train. The, 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 my son's here. The disciple. Thomas was most active in Syria, but then went on to India, where the ancient Christians revere him as their founder. They claim that Thomas died when pierced with multiple spears by four different soldiers. We've got a family here at SRC, the Thomas family, from India. They are from the place there where Thomas evangelized. Uh, it, Thomas is a very common name in India from that region. They took on the name of the apostle that brought the gospel of Jesus Christ into that region in India. What happened to Philip? Well, thanks for asking. Philip. He had a powerful ministry, signs, wonders, miracles, in Carthage, which is in North Africa, in the Asia Minor, where he converted the wife of the Roman proconsul. In retaliation, her husband had him arrested and cruelly and brutally put to death. In just a second, I'm going to give an altar call after reading all these horrific stories, and we'll see who wants to join. Is that good? Matthew, whatever happened to the, to the tax collector? Matthew, the writer of the gospel, ministered in Persia and in Ethiopia, where it's reported he was stabbed to death. Bartholomew. Bartholomew had a widespread ministry travel, uh, attributed by tradition, went to India with Thomas, and then back to Armenia, and also to Ethiopia and southern Arabia. There are various accounts of how he met his death, but was most definitely a martyr for the gospel. James. James is said to have ministered in Syria. The Jewish historian Josephus reported that he was stoned, okay? Imagine this. He was stoned, okay, until nearly dead, but then he wasn't dead, so then they took clubs and killed him. Yay. Okay, Simon the Zealot. What happened to Simon the Zealot? So the story goes, he ministered in Persia and then was killed after refusing to offer a sacrifice to the sun god. Matthias. Matthias the apostle chosen to replace Judas. Um, uh, he went to Syria with Andrew. And then, um, uh, and then he was murdered. He was executed by being burned at the stake. We see Mark. Mark went to Libya and Egypt among his travels. In Alexandria... They dragged him through the streets with horses, and then they burned his body. This is why they don't let me teach Sunday school anymore. Okay. Luke. What happened to Luke? Remember Dr. Luke? Okay. Wrote the book of Acts. Luke was hung on an olive tree by Greek priest. John. John the Beloved. He was the only, check it out, out of all the followers of Christ, uh, the church fathers in this era, he was the only apostle that died a natural death from old age. And that's speculation since there's no record of him actually dying. So we do know that he was one of the church fathers uh, within the churches of Ephesus. He took care of the mother of Jesus. He took care of Mary in his very own home. Um, during the persecution in the 90s, he was exiled to the island of Patmos. And there he wrote his last book, The Revelation of the Christ. And he escaped unhurt after being cast into boiling oil at Rome. The only guy where there's no record of his death, it's not because they didn't try. Because usually boiling people in oil usually works. Okay. We know that at least four of the apostles, disciples, were fishermen. We know that the culture was so anti-Christ during this time. Yeah, you know, I, I was reading, uh, my, a friend of mine on Facebook said, this is the end. Things have never been so bad. This, you know, they're, look out, we're talking... 666, Mark of the Beast, 
the Antichrist, like this is it, you guys. Things have never been this bad. In this time, okay, the way that Christians identified themselves is, is, is when they thought they might be with another believer, they would take their foot, okay? There was no WWJD bracelets, okay? This, this, this would get your eyes gouged out. So what would, what would you do? If you thought you might be with another believer, a Christian would take their foot and form the top of the ichthys, a fish. And if the other person was a believer, they would take their foot and form the bottom of the ichthys. Follower of Jesus, friend of the fisherman, they would complete the fish, which meant Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, in the Greek, ichthys. Yeah? Why do, we, why do we talk about all this? We talk about all this because cultural upheaval, disruption, when you read about chaos, historically, these are the atmospheres by which the church of Jesus Christ thrives. In China, to this day, there are still several indicators by which even the most reformed of the reformed would admit that there is revival in China and we know that the great persecution against the church has created an atmosphere where the church of Jesus Christ can thrive. My dad did a conference in China, and so he said, all right, let's go to the underground church. They took him to a hotel room. When they opened up the hotel room, you got two queen beds. Every square inch of that room was full of bodies. People crammed into a small hotel room like sardines in a can. They had been waiting for him. They had all kinds of indicators and ways of letting people know if the authorities were coming. That these kinds of atmospheres create atmospheres for expansion and for the church of Jesus Christ to thrive. We know in Korea, there was a great, um, uh, uh, really a shaming of that country that took place through the Japanese um, occupation there that as a nation. They were unable to really save face. It was such, such a disgraceful time for the, for the Korean people. And as they sought the Lord, Korea saw a, a mighty, powerful move of God where almost an entire nation would admit to being Christian. Statistically, they say, uh, like conservatively, about 40% of the people throughout the entire nation confess Jesus as Lord. Many, many others would say it was closer to 90%, just depending on who, on who you talk to. Our family was in Ireland, and while in Ireland, uh, uh, early, early 2000s, they hosted a conference, and a sound, a sound of war began to emerge. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't just, it wasn't like fun worship. How many of you love, I love fun worship, like, He's a lord of the dance. He's a dancing lord. He's a lord. Of, like, give me a flag. Give me a tambour. He's a lord of the dance. No, no. Like, in Ireland, during this time, you've got hotels that are being bombed by the IRA. You've got churches that are being, that are being burned. That during this time, uh, early 2000s, it was a time of, of much upheaval within Northern Ireland. And it was there in Northern Ireland, there in Ballyclare, that a sound began to emerge. And that, that conference went from three days to a week to two weeks to three weeks. Uh, my, my, I, I got flown in with a friend of mine that played guitar. We got to be a part of the worship team. You would only worship God for so long, and then the sound would begin to hijack the atmosphere. The, and what the sound was, all these young men with big barrels, these huge um, metal barrels and plastic barrels and the sound would, and they had big things of rebar so these were strong kids and all of a sudden they would begin to bang the drums and, and they began known as the, the drummers of Ballyclare and, 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 that, and that revival was, was called Fireland and, a, and an album came out of there and there was a sound that began to shift the frequency and political climate within Ireland how many know that before Reformation that before Revolution there's always a sound that began begins to precede the revolution. I, I, I tell you what, I, I hear a new sound in my heart. I hear a new sound
sound in my voice. I, I feel a sound in my posture. And I'm, I, I, I ain't preaching like it's 2019. But it, it, it ain't 2019. There's a new sound in me. There's a sound of awakening in me. There's a sound of like, like it's, it's time. Now is the time. It's, it, there's a precedent that's been established that when there's conflict, that when there's upheaval, that when there's chaos, that when there's a storm, there is a, there is a savior in the midst of the, of the storm. Now I find myself uh, not in China and not in Korea and not in Ireland. I, I, I got to go to, uh, to Indonesia and my dad went into Indonesia. First time there in, in 2099, the, 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 the pillars of smoke were coming out. of. He landed in Jakarta as fires were coming out of, out of the city. Those fires were churches that were being burned by radical uh, 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 jihadists and, and by radical Muslims. And, 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 and what happened was there in the midst of those burnings, the glory of God began, began to visit churches. And, and all of a sudden, the, the manifest glory would begin to visit these churches. And, 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 and one church that my dad was at, it went from 300 people to 3,000 people. Just They had to go from building to building till they had over 13,000 members. And they finally built a church sanctuary that was about the size of the Tacoma Dome that had its own exit right off of the freeway in a Muslim country and you would go to those services they would have, they still do this all these all these dancers at the front, just the front of the church is about the size of our entire sanctuary and they would have these worship productions where the pastor's wife would go to heaven and see how they're worshiping in heaven and then recreate these heavenly worship uh, atmospheres and in the services, the church stepped into so much influence and affluence into so much wealth that they actually began to uh, build a hospital. And they built a hospital so they could do free medical for the Muslims. And then they, they built a, uh, a dentist's office to be able to do free dental work, again, for the Muslims. I'll tell you something. How do you know that you're in the midst of revival? How do you know you're in the midst of, of awakening? Because you find yourself on a wave where there's so much favor and there's so much... L listen, we don't get... I I've heard people poo-poo revival before, and, and they're like, there's no such thing as revival. The reason why I say is because they've never been in one. And, I and I've been in over four moves of God, and I can tell you that revival's not a unicorn with a little rainbow mane. Revival's not a leprechaun. Revival is the spirit of Christ Jesus that is, that, that where there's a sustaining momentum where it's a sustain. Revival's not one meeting. Revival is not an event. Revival is this place where a remnant, where a company of people say, I am too old. I am too young. Life is too short to be stinking religious. I'm going all in. All my chips are in that I am signing up to this thing because I am going to be an occupier. I'm going to occupy the earth. I'm going to sub be a part of something that can subdue, that can, that can revive, that can refresh, that can reform. You're not in China. You're not in Korea. You're not in Indonesia. You're not in Ireland. You were in a pretty peaceful place. Believe it or not, I know, I know, I know we were still complaining in 2019. We thought it was the worst year ever. 2019. Welcome to 2020. We're making the news. It used to be that these other nations were making, making you see the riots and you'd see the gas and you'd see, you'd see, you'd see, you'd see the murders. You'd see all the, you'd see the, the, the radicals. And, 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 and you're seeing that now, but it's not happening in Africa. It's happening in our streets. It's happening at the landing in Renton. It happened at Bothell. It just happened in Bell every week. The spirit of lawlessness. And guess what? That's not on President Obama. And guess what? That's not on President Trump. Here's what happens. You get in a storm. You want to start throwing everybody overboard until you find your Jonah. It's on us. We've been called to govern. We've been called to be given the keys to the kingdom. We've been called for such a time as this. The eyes of the nations are on the United States of America and all the eyes and ears of creation are on the sons and daughters of God waiting for us to wake up to our identity, to who we are 
in Christ Jesus. I pray that we would wake up to the fact that we're not a cowardly little lion that lost our roar, that's trying to find our way to the, that we're not some sort of tin man trying to find a little bit of oil. You are a son, you are a daughter of righteousness called for such a time as this, that you've not been called to live in a cave. You've been called to come out of the cave and, be, and to begin to do something with some mighty men of David, that God has created you. He has formed you. He has framed you to live in the glory, to live in the anointing, Anointing, to live with him, to know his voice, to know his presence with the sensitivity, with the discernment, to be able to tell the difference between the holy and the profane. This place where if you get a sermon here, that's great. But if, if you don't, that's great. Why? Because you get a word from the Lord. Every morning you wake up, you wake up into his word. And when you go to sleep at night, you go to sleep in his word. This place where you've decided in your heart, I will fear God. I will fear God. I will fear God. And I won't fear man. Listen, I don't care what people say about me. I don't care what people write about me. I care if they're not, because that probably means I'm not doing anything. That the second you begin to do something for the Lord, you'll, you'll know it. Why? Because first will come those who think they know what's up, those who think they know God. They'll be the first to come against you. And then the second wave could be governmental. Nobody ever saw, you know, this whole thing who ever thought there would come a time when it'd be illegal to go to church? I read about the pilgrims. The pilgrims who came to this country because they wanted to find a place where there'd be separation of church and state. They wanted to find a place where they'd be able to worship their God without interference. And I'm so worried when there's a people on the earth that are always looking for more governmental interaction uh, that this place of, we need more, we need more government and we need more, more government. That's not why we came here, you guys. Like, 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 like the pilgrims, they came here. You know, like, like I know this is, I know this is complicated, but I'm telling you that there are things happening here that have never happened in the United States of America before. And I'll tell you what's going to fix it. Not just voting and not just spouting off on social. I'll tell you what's going to fix it. A people that begin to possess what they're actually professing. Because I hear a lot of this, but I don't see a lot of signs and wonders. I don't see a lot of miracles. I don't see a lot of evangelism because of really bad theology that there could be 600,000 missionaries and the rest of us, we just go to church on Sunday and drink some coffee in the, in the cafe. That is that is poop. <laughs> I'd go stronger, but I won't. The day that we separate, listen, John Piper, one of my favorite reformed preachers, he says, missions exist because worship doesn't. And when true worship gets restored to the earth, a major missions mandate and integration will be seen because when you really worship him, what is in you will come out of you. Worship has become no different than what New Agers do with Yanni music or John Tesh. New Agers put on certain kinds of music to make themselves feel good. A lot of Christians, they put on Christian music just to feel good, but it has nothing to do with connecting and abiding and receiving and this, this, this place of revelation to who we are in Jesus Christ. A lot of Christians look no different than New Agers. And God is calling for us to wake up to who we are, that you have the keys, you have the solution, and if you're faithful with the little, he'll give you more. If you're faithful, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the comforter. Some of you, you need some comfort this morning because of the sermon. You're gonna need a comforter when you start taking risks for the Lord. Why? You might not see the outcome that you thought you were gonna get. And at that point, you're going to need a comfort. Listen, when I get rejected, when I'm sharing the gospel with someone, and I get, and I get rejected, I, that doesn't bother me. Why? Because I, I don't believe that's the final outcome. Why? Because when I plant a seed, and it doesn't grow immediately, I got more wisdom than that. I know I planted a seed, and it's just a matter of time. It's going to grow. It's going to grow. 
So many times in the church, we pray for someone to get healed and then they don't recover. We think that that was the outcome. That's not the outcome. There will be justice in every single situation of your life because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Even death is not the final injustice. Jesus Christ overcame death, sickness, uh, disease, all of these things that don't allow death to be the final say within your lives because you lost somebody that you love. Listen, I'm telling you, that's not the final outcome. This whole thing that we call life, this is just training. This is just training for reigning. It's time, it's time to arise, to shine, to awaken, to find your voice, to find your voice. You don't need to find the wizard. He already found you. You didn't choose him, he chose you. It's time, it's time, it's time, it's time, it's time. I'm waiting for the week of awakening. No, you don't have to wait for that. You should be waiting for 2,000 years ago when Holy Spirit came. It's on. What's it going to look like when you're on the wave? What's it going to look like when you're on the wave? What's your business going to look like when you're on the wave? What's your marriage going to look like when you're on the wave? What nations are you going to be going to when you're on the wave? What's technology going to look like when you're on the wave? What's missions going to look like when you're on the wave? I was born to surf. I wasn't born to sit on the beach. I'll do that a couple weeks out of the year, but I was born to surf. I was born to ride a wave. You were born to surf. You were born to ride a wave. What's it going to look like? It's okay. It's okay to begin to dream with me a little bit. Just dream with me a little bit. I know like so many of us, we get hope deferred. I don't want to think about it. Just tradition is so much safer. Nah. Nah. Jesus didn't die so you can be traditional. So that everybody knows what they're going to get out. Listen, they don't know you. They don't know you. They don't, Julie, they don't know you like he knows you. What's it going to look like? What's it going to look like? My prayer for you is that you would get a gift of faith, not hype. Not, not that somebody could hype you up into, into something. Ah, I believe I can fly. I'm still on the earth. You know, the, the, a supernatural gift of faith that you know in your knower that all of his promises are yes and amen. And you position yourself now with tomorrow in mind. You position yourself now on the board, paddling, paddling, working, working. Why? The moment's going to come when I don't have to paddle anymore. The moment's going to come when I just got to get up and ride that wave. When you're ready, in your perfect timing, don't want to rush you, stand to your feet. Acts 4, the text that we didn't read. Brandon, I'm going to come down if you could light me up. Peter and John have been arrested. Why? Because they healed a man that had been crippled for 40 years. governing authorities say, we're going to let you out under one condition, that you stop ministering in the name of Jesus. They get released. They all come back together in verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and they reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard it, they lifted their voice together to God and they began to pray. Would you lift your hands with me? This is the prayer of the first century church after having their lives threatened for doing good. Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves against the rulers which were gathered together, positioning themselves against the Lord and against his anointed ones. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel 
to do whatever your hand and your plan and predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to speak your word with all boldness. Pray this with me. And now, Lord, look upon their threats. Grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal signs and wonders are performed through your name the holy servant Jesus and it says in verse 31 and when they had prayed the place where they were gathered began to shake and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they continued to speak the word of God with all boldness.